The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar of ClearEdge 3D. Excited to uh, have uh, Robert Klaschka with us from the UK uh, to talk about uh, construction QAQC workflows, uh, best practices, and some uh, new technologies and also to give a little bit of a sneak peek at uh, Verity 1.5. Um, let's go ahead and hop to the next slide here, do a little housekeeping. Um, so we are, uh, uh, you know, of course, going to keep everybody muted as usual. Uh, please ask questions via the chat during the session. Uh, we will uh, pick up Q&A. Uh, at the end, we may do a little Q&A after Robert gets done talking, uh, depending on how we are on schedule. Uh, and uh, we are recording this webinar, so uh, we'll be sending out the link for the webinar to everybody who is uh, registered or attending uh, after uh, a couple days after the uh, webinar is done. So uh, to do some introductions, uh, we have got uh, Robert Klaschka with us today, uh, who is the uh, director of the Digital Built Environment, which I think is uh, one of the cooler titles uh, <laughs> that I've seen. And he is with uh, Sumo Services. Uh, so, Robert is part of the infamous UK BIM crew uh, and uh, has uh, uh, been around uh, the, the BIM industry and really involved with uh, BIM Level 2 in particular, uh, getting that uh, kind of specified and rolled out, uh, participate in, uh, in survey for BIM, uh, and interestingly, is an expert ocean sailor. Uh, so apparently, uh, Robert, you and I need to uh, go spend some time out on a boat sometime, because uh, that sounds like fun, uh, except for the night trapped by a storm on an uh, Antarctic island. That does not sound like fun. Uh, otherwise, I'm your host today, uh, Kelly Cohn, a VP of product here at ClearEdge 3D, uh, background in architecture, uh, spent 10 years in BIM and VDC uh, in the industry before coming on board here at ClearEdge. And I am speaking to you today from a conference room in DFW Airport after hopping off a, a nine and a half hour flight from Tokyo. Uh, so if I fall asleep um, while talking, uh, I apologize, but I am a little jet lagged. Uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, with that, uh, let me go ahead and uh, turn things over to, uh, to Robert here. Uh, take it away. <coughs> Hi there, everybody. Um, today, I'm going to talk about our experience of using Verity. Um, and I've got two case studies to run through um, in that context. Um, we've been using Verity for nearly a year now. Um, bought it not too long after it was uh, originally released. Um, very good uh, reception in the UK market at the moment. Um, and um, uh, we're increasingly getting uh, um, interest in uh, in verification as a workflow. Um, I'm starting to see uh, main contractors um, requiring it, um, and it all um, a lot of it relates in um, in our experience as surveyors um, to the um, requirement uh, that relates to level two BIM for accurate as built information. So. A lot of the things and a second um, uh, case study I'll show um, is about helping specialist subcontractors get um, get their as-built information correct. Um, so I don't, I haven't got the controls at the moment, uh, Kelly. We'll see if we can get that fixed here. Oh, yeah. oh there yeah. we go. Well, I shall start speaking anyway. <laughs> so obviously um, there, why, verification and this is a it's a real bugbear of mine in a sense in that if you look at the um, sort of work that we're doing at the moment with Verity it is generally that we get called in when something has gone wrong um, and I think that there are a number of reasons for that um, it's uh, partly because people just don't know um, what can be done um, anymore and that's my job because I go out and see clients and tell them about that sort of thing um, but um, also, you've got this sort of interplay between um, 
when a package is finished, probably the subcontractor is still on site at that point. Um, and so it's easy to get them to correct things. Um, and uh, and also probably they haven't been paid yet, so they're perhaps more amenable to, uh, to fixing things. Um, that's not to say that verification is about um, demonizing um, subcontractors because the, the more verification I do, the more I realize that actually perhaps we don't build things as well as we think we build them, but actually it's okay anyway. Um, I don't think, for example, that um, since we have started running software verifications on projects, um, suddenly people have started building buildings worse. Um, but in the same way that if you run uh, a clash detection in Navisworks, um, it throws up lots of, uh, of clashes or soft clashes, potential clashes. Um, but a lot of the time you might find out of a thousand clashes, there are only maybe sort of 10 to 20 that are actually ones that you really need to address. And uh, a lot of the time that is the, uh, the same with, uh, with verification. It just sort of reveals where, um, where things are. Um, the process as we um, uh, offer it to main contractors as well is not about uh, demonizing people. It's about finding problems early and helping people fix them, um, knowing more um, rather than uh, uh, getting, um, getting, getting the law involved, um, which is never a good idea in construction projects, as I'm sure we all know. Um, yeah, so I will move on to the first slide. Ah, oh, there we go. Excellent. Right. So this is quite an interesting case study in that it's, um, in many ways, it's not sort of what the product says it's uh, to do on, uh, um, or it's not. It's not the way the product is sold, as in um, checking something for somebody who's building something. Um, we were in this instance working for a steelwork fabricator um, on uh, who were taking on a steel frame that had been um, sitting dormant for two years, having um, effectively there had been a dispute by the owner of the site um, and the old steel frame uh, uh, and the, uh, the previous steel framework subcontractor. Um, and so they'd gone their separate ways. And then two years later, um, the uh, the a new steelworks uh, subcontractor, our client, was hired, and um, they were being expected to take ownership of uh, of something that they they didn't know what it was. Um, we'd also, and uh, this was why we um, decided it'd be a good idea to roll out Verity on it, um, been given um, a design model for the building, um, and that immediately threw up a couple of um, of uh, challenges that I'll talk about later on. Um, but it, effectively, what we were doing in this instance is um, just helping the um, the uh, steelwork fabricator know that uh, what what was there was um, was what they were expecting to be there. You can see um, a picture of the of the steel frame, um, and below is actually the visual representation that we got out of Verity. Um, and with all that all that red and yellow there, um, if you're a Verity user. Um, you're probably thinking, "Cool, that looks pretty terrible." I mean, basically, the green stuff is built and to tolerance. Um, the yellow stuff is built and to not to tolerance, um, and the red stuff is not there. So maybe it was partly unfinished. Um, actually, um, it's a more interesting story than that. <clears throat> right. Let's go on to the next slide. Okay, so. Um, first, a little bit about how we collected data on site. Um, we were using, and we generally at Sumo, we're using um, Faro S1 uh, or, or Faro scanners. Um, in this instance, one of the newer ones, an S150. Um, and then the scanning data was uh, georeferenced and controlled with, um, with some of our Trimble um, total stations and GPSs. Um, that was all very well. Um, but we had this issue, which was that the design model wasn't in any, um, uh, it wasn't in national grid, it wasn't in the coordinate space, um, and any evidence of any control network around the site that uh, the the, uh, the existing steelwork had been set out by um, was was not there. <clears throat> this is something that happens on 
most of the work that we're doing at the moment with Verity because we're, we're not getting in at the beginning. We're getting in um, uh, when uh, when uh, there's a need in this instance, um, not so much a problem as, uh, as a need. Um, so um, what we actually ended up having to do was best fit. Um, I'll also say that for larger steel frames, we probably um, uh, would generally use um, one of the sort of higher range and cleaner quality scanners, something like a, a, a uh, like a P40 um, or one of the new ZNF uh, 5016s um, to collect the data. Because um, as you would imagine, uh, the quality of a veri verification um, is um, very much related to the quality of the point cloud that you feed it. Um, and uh, you'll see in my second case study, which uses uh, GeoSlam data, um, you uh, with uh, lower, lower accuracy and, uh, and fuzzier scan data, Verity still works very well, um, but you need to um, fit the, uh, the hardware to the, uh, to the sort of, uh, really the sort of range that you're trying to fit things within. So, so uh, hey, Robert, one, one quick uh -huh. question for you. Um, yeah. So how exactly did you do the, the best fit? I know this is, uh, we, we hear this a fair amount from our, uh, from our users and uh, potential customers that uh, you know, they're interested in being able to best fit it. And it's, it's not something we put into the software yet because there's a lot of, mm. uh, a lot of uh, potential accuracy issues uh, when one does that if one doesn't do it with a real survey mindset. And so I, I'm, I'm curious what, uh, what kind of methodology you mm. use. Um, it was pretty ugly with this one, to be honest. <laughs> um, I've, got a, I've got a better methodology now, um, which we used on the, uh, on the second case study. Um, but with this, um, because we, we had the point cloud in the right place and we were actually expecting, as we subsequently did, to get commissioned to um, produce a new structural model in Edgewise from our scan data. We wanted the verification to happen in the in, in the correct coordinate space. Um, so the way that we did this, um, and uh, it, this is going to sound a little bit Heath Robinson, um, as I'm sure you know, um, in Revit, um, it's really not keen on you moving things. The model we had was a Revit model, um, but what we did was we um, exported the Revit model as an IFC file um, and then brought that IFC file back into Revit and that immediately gives you this sort of homogenous um, uh, file which isn't going to sort of move around and um, be attached to levels and that sort of thing. Um, and so we then effectively did a, um, a sort of long axis best fit um, and tried a number of um, of different sort of uh, fits with um, with particular columns um, what that threw up was actually the quality of the um, positioning of the steel frame was really not particularly good you were um, you know even if you um, assessed the um, without uh, reviewing it against the design model even if you assessed the position of the the columns they were out by more than British standard tolerances anyway um, which, you know, in, in the grand scheme of things is not um, ultimately a build issue. Um, it may, but it may create unexpected pinch points. Um, uh, so, yeah, it, uh, like I said, um, a bit of an ugly fit with this. Um, uh, what we're doing at the moment with um, uh, where we haven't got a, a, um, a targeted coordinate system, a proper survey coordinate system, um, now um, is uh, something a bit cleverer than that, where we're sort of tying it to multiple points in the model. So you're getting a much more averaged out um, fit between the things. Um, whereas this was, uh, it was, uh, it was pretty ugly, <laughs> an ugly hack, I would call it. Um, go on. Oh, no, just, just say, and understood, and go on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So um, you can see, um, and I, I'm, I, I won't show you too much of how the software works because I think everybody has, uh, has seen it now, but you can see um, in a real life situation, there's a, a, these two images that I've included um, here are quite interesting because there are really relatively small items that Verity has picked up um, as 
missing. For example, in the top image, you've got a flat on the bottom of an I-beam, um, which is missing. Um, Verity spotted that. Um, the I-beam is there, but it's uh, not in the right place, as you can see, because the result is coming out as yellow. Um, and then uh, if you look at these uh, steel tables on the lower image, um, they um, give you a, f a flavor for why I like to describe this sort of process. And, and using edgewise to capture steel frame or pipe work is a similar sort of um, uh, description I'd give to it. It's a, it's a semi-automated process. The software goes a long way to um, take you to a position of understanding things, but you still need to review it. Um, and so here you can see these two steel tables, both missing. Um, that's pretty evident. Um, but if you look at the one that is in the corner of the building, I think probably what Verity has done is it's seen the face of the wall in the instance of those two columns, which are showing as um, found but uh, out of tolerance. Um, in reality, and so what one needs to do in that situation when you're going through and reviewing the uh, the uh, the verification, the status of those needs to be changed to not found. Um, so it's not it's not um, uh, an entirely automated process, but uh, but nothing is. Um, and uh, anybody who thinks that uh, the I believe the phrase is the easy button exists, it doesn't. <laughs> um, right. There's a a good story about this as well from uh, the perspective of uh, of our office in that. Um, what the verification um, proved to the steelwork fabricator was that they needed a, a fresh model because what in, in reality, the design model that we'd been given, we came to the conclusion was probably an earlier iteration of the design because there were bits where steels were clearly not just um, installed slightly out of position, but there were fundamental differences. The, uh, the red area um, that I pointed out at the front of the um, model uh, was uh, effectively a roof that had been um, a different, it was a different design. It had gone from being a, um, a double pitched roof to a mono pitched roof in, uh, in what we'd surveyed on site. I'll move on to uh, the second case study now. So this is really quite an interesting um, project. One, because um, we uh, we were using the GeoSlam for it, and I've got some, I suppose you might say, slightly unconventional ideas about uh, doing things like putting um, hardware in the hands of people who uh, um, wouldn't traditionally use it um, in the context of this sort of uh, exercise. Um, but also, we, we used the GeoSlam for this, um, and it was uh, our first time doing a services verification. And also, we were initially, we were doing a partition location verification. Um, we've got a lot of experience of the GeoSlam and um, I think it's one of the sort of unsung heroes of, uh, of the world where you've got um, you know, all the hype around uh, things like the BLK. Um, the Geo GeoSlam, in my view, is um, it's a great piece of kit because you can just survey a massive amount of area. It's not as accurate um, in that you're typically, and we've satisfied ourselves of this, um, you're looking at a sort of plus or minus 30 millimeters across a whole building, um, uh, and uh, but uh, but you can you can cover huge areas. Um, in the last year, we've done about a quarter of a million square meters of school surveys um, with the GeoSlam, um, and you know you're you're talking about between six and ten thousand square meters in a day. It's uh, it's really amazing. Com compare that to 800 to 2,000 square meters with uh, with traditional scanning. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's a great piece of kit. Um, initially, we were contracted to um, to verify the partition locations, um, and so um, and because we were using uh, GeoSlam data, um, and this is this is why um, why we use the GeoSlam um, with partitions and with services for this type of building. It's a biomedical facility, um, really. If, uh, if a wall is within 50 millimeters or 100 millimeters of its position, um, it's probably okay. Um, again, with duct work, if, um, if a duct is 100 millimeters away from where it was, um, it's probably gonna be all right, perhaps, perhaps less, uh, more of an issue in this instance because you'll, you'll see just how packed the services are. Um, 
but uh, you, we certainly wouldn't use GSLAM data, for example, for um, uh, steelwork verification. There, you need the accuracy of um, of the high definition scanning. Um, the other thing that was uh, quite uh, cool about this particular job is we used the uh, Revo real time registration, and uh, that worked. Uh, it worked really well. You can see here um, uh, in the images that I'm showing. Um, the first is uh, a section with top cut off, um, and that is showing the normals of the scan data. Um, basically, um, the uh, the software uses the normals to uh, to establish what side of a wall it's looking at, and that's pretty essential. Um, and then the uh, the top um, section is looking up at the services, and that's just coloured by elevation, so you can see all of the different levels of pipe work and duct work and cable trays. Right, I'll go on to the next slide. And, and one thing to note is yeah. that uh, uh, that that's using the uh, the technical preview uh, functionality. So uh, if uh, if anybody uh, listening in is a current user, you know you need to use terrestrial scanners and you can't use mobile scanners. But uh, with the one of 1.1 1 .1 version, maybe it was 1.11, 1 .1, uh, we launched a technical uh, preview uh, where we are able to leverage GeoSlam data. Uh, to actually uh, do most of the, the checking work that we can do with terrestrial data. So if anybody's interested in that, uh, reach out to us. We're happy to get you a tech preview license so you can uh, test it out too. Uh, it's so definitely sorry, can worth. Continue uh, on. No, it's, it's definitely worth reviewing. Definitely worth reviewing. Um, so um, this is the result from the um, partition layout verification. You can see um, that. Broadly speaking, this is um, this is looking pretty good. We've got a lot of green walls. We've got a small number of yellow walls, um, and again, a small number of uh, red walls which were missing. Um, uh, and actually, if you go and review the scan data, you can see that some of these things were areas where where uh, where the installation wasn't complete. Um, it's worth just raising. Um, and in fact, actually, I think I, I, I'm going to talk about it at the end. So sorry, I, I apologise. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll move on from that. Um, what uh, um, what we, we what we did do was uh, demonstrate this was largely uh, largely complete. Um, and now uh, I'd uh, I'd said um, before that uh, the first project I showed was uh, um, a little bit sort of ugly of uh, an ugly hack um, to make it fit. Um, with this again. Um, and you're reliant on this with the GeoSlam data at the present, um, though uh, at the moment we've got, um, we're expecting in the development pipeline to have uh, georeferencing coming into the um, uh, into GeoSlam Hub, and then then we'll be able to do everything in one package. Um, but at the moment, to position GeoSlam data is um, a bit of a sort of round tripping exercise in that you're registering the GeoSlam clouds and then um, putting uh, them together in uh, in GeoSlam with the merge tool, but then we have to push E57s out of that. And what we're doing is using Pharoscene to um, to then uh, georeference the uh, the GeoSlam data after it's been pushed out, um, and that then after that has to go into uh, Recap because. Uh, um, uh, Verity uses recap data um, for for its verification, um, certainly for the uh, for the GeoSlam data anyway. Um, the, uh, so you may ask the question, how did we put the scan in the right position? Um, and in fact, what we did was we took the corners of um, a series of columns throughout the space that we could see in the uh, in the scan data, um, and then. Um, we uh, we took coordinates from the uh, from the Revit model, which was georeferenced. Um, in fact, actually, in the end, what we did was uh, use the internal coordinate system from Revit um, rather than the georeferenced data, um, because that put the scan data on uh, on small coordinates rather than big coordinates, and um, and um, we, we were having problems with the big coordinate versions of it, um, but. What that gave was a network of points across the um, floor plan um, that um, that uh, Pharoscene was then tying the data to, um, and the results from that were very encouraging. The 
um, error across the entire network of points was no more than 30 millimeters, um, which was what uh, what we were expecting. Um, here with the wall lay layout, we um, we verified against um, a 50 millimeter, and with the services that I'll show next, we verified against 100 millimeters. Um, it's worth just um, stopping and thinking what that what that means, what the point cloud. Um, being um, being plus or minus 30 millimeters means to to the verification, um, and I think uh, there's uh, there's there's some work that we could do. Um, it's some, something I've been talking to Kevin about um, to uh, to use Verity to help reveal the uh, sort of compound accuracy of the point cloud on top of the accuracy of the um, actual installation. Um, I'll uh, perhaps Kevin and I will talk about that a little bit later. So on to part two of the verification. Um, here you're looking at uh, what we've done is uh, isolated all of the ductwork um, for this floor. You can see as a biomedical building, it's got a very complicated services installation. Um, and so what we actually did, um, and I've become a bit of a Navisworks um, selection guru, you, you, you'll need to do that if, um, if you're getting into verifying this sort of thing. Um, because you just don't want to be, I would say, it's you're just making life difficult for yourself if you're verifying thousands of items um, or tens of thousands of items. It's better to break it into bits. So here you can see the isolated ductwork and then one of the verifications below, and that's uh, all of the stuff that was green. In this instance, we were isolating by color in Navisworks, which worked very well to give us smaller sets of data. Um, uh, again, you can see here from the verification that we've got, um, and it's quite interesting results here. The green, um, in fact, I think the green and uh, also the sort of flesh colored bits, which are uncertain, um, are installed, but they were actually above, there, were, there, were, there was a lot of um, services below. And so in fact, what we needed to do was, um, or, and what we're going to do is go back um, and, do more geoslam uh, surveying where we're um, just one of the neat things you can do with the geoslam is put it on a pole and just push it up into the gaps in between the services um, but that was a that was a lesson that we learned from this um, yeah so that is that I'll just run yeah I don't, what, and the, the one thing that is worth saying and you'll see this on some of the slides uh, or some of the images for the uh, my remaining two slides you've got um, in this instance, a lot of small discrepancies. Um, I don't know how uh, how good your services installations are in the States, but it is a common assumption in the UK that services are going to be installed in a in a slightly different location than they're said uh, than they're expected, and in some instances, a very different location. Um, right, let me see if I can move on to. I'm. Not getting the control at the moment again, uh, Kelly. Uh, let's see if we can push it back. That's odd. Kevin, maybe you can uh, pop us forward a slide here. Yeah, I've, I've only got two more slides, so uh, you can oh. um, you can push it. Sorry, I just take control to... again, Kevin. Do you, Do you want to move forward? <laughs> yeah, one slide forwards, please. Okay. Is that correct? Uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm not. I'm still seeing the slide, which is the um, colored ducts. This has red and white. Ah, right. OK, so my screen Best. is not update. Oh, I think you um, want the one with uh, the red, green and yellow. Yeah, that sounds correct. I'm not I'm not seeing the. OK, it's I think my. Best yeah, practices okay. for successful construction verification. Plan the enabling work to allow verification to happen fast. Right. Okay. It it um, just showed up on my end for for some reason. The GoTo meeting refresh went really really slow. Ah right. Okay. Yeah, I got it. Right. So yes, that's that's it's the yeah it's the one with the red and green image in the two circles. That's okay. the one we want. Um. Right, that's perfect. Okay, 
Right. So, um, just a, and and I'll I'll one I'll talk around the images, but also these are sort of lessons learnt. Um, the the um, one of the things that is a recurring theme that I've already sort of alluded to is that on many of the jobs that we do, we're coming in late, and so we uh, we don't have a control network that we can actually um, connect to. Um, and uh, sorry, that's gone forwards again. Was that me there or you? Go. I, I just did it. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, um, I'm not sure what's going on there, Robert. <laughs> it's, it's no problem. It's, uh, there's a bit of a lag on it, I think, at the moment. But uh, so um, one of the things that we keep coming across, and actually I'm, uh, I was uh, really pleased to find there was a, a school building that I was uh, visiting today um, talking that we're talking about doing verification again of services on. Um, and uh, there they had a bunch of retro targets around the site which we can use to georeference the data that we're going to collect. Um, so that is an example of uh, a site which already had the uh, the control that we uh, that we can then use. Um, but a lot of the time um, there's an education exercise to um, uh, to bring your um, clients up to speed that they um, that it's a it's a good idea to. Um, to plan for the verification. Um, what is also good from surveyor's perspective um, is that that um, means that we're more <clears throat> integrated in the process. Um, and so if you know if you've got a main contractor thinking about you doing things early in the process or thinking about what you need early in the process, they're much more likely to get you on site to do other survey tasks. Oh, there we go. Back to the first slide again. That's perfect. Just leave it there for the moment. Um, <clears throat> so um, if you've got that control network, then positioning the scan data is a much, much quicker exercise. And one of the things that particularly relates to these uh, services verifications is the, um, the, uh, the speed of uh, turnaround of the verification. We're typically looking at um, being on site, collecting data, or somebody else collecting data on site for us, um, and then us reporting by the end of the following day. And the reason that I say that is that if you're verifying a steel frame, um, you need to provide that information very urgently because if the steel fabricator has started fixing metal deck, then the opportunity to adjust the steel frame if there's a problem is gone at that point. And likewise with, uh, with services, if services have been covered up, um, then uh, again, uh, the opportunity to make uh, make changes or um, um, improve uh, the position of things is gone at that point. Um, I'll just point you at the image here. Um, if you look at the top uh, red uh, circle, you can see if you look at the point cloud behind in the bottom of that uh, uh, reducer, you can see actually the reducer in reality in the point cloud is uh, is at a lower angle, so it. Uh, it looks like that uh, reducer is coming down to a wider run of duct. And then again, if you look at this, um, uh, uh, I don't know whether it's an intake or, a, or an, an extract there, the, um, the, uh, the lower red circle, you can see that that yellow area um, is really in a, a quite a different position about sort of um, uh, from memory about 400 millimeters different than, uh, than we were expecting. Um, I'll touch on uh, one more point very briefly because we've not done a great deal of this yet, but I really see this as, a, as the way forwards for us, um, is with services verification particularly, um, the, um, the number of times that we're, uh, we're likely to need to visit site on a complicated installation like this if we're um, collecting data before packages are covered up um, is very great. And the problem with that is that um, we get called out for a day. That's a it's a day of cost, even if we're doing um, just an hour of scanning. And so what I'm looking at doing, um, and we've piloted this on uh, on this project, is effectively leasing a scanner to um, a main contractor and training their team up to collect the data because they're collecting smaller areas um, and because the GSLAM registration process is very robust. Um, effectively, what uh, what I, 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 I'm very comfortable with that. What we're then doing is bringing that data in um, 
uh, reviewing it to check that the quality is adequate and then running the verification in-house ourselves and pushing the report back. What that means is that the, um, the price point for this sort of verification um, uh, can end up being um, really quite low. Um, you, you know, it's a sort of um, low-cost bulk operation. Um, so if you could move on to the uh, following slide, uh, Kevin. And while we're waiting for that to uh, refresh, uh, just a quick reminder to the audience, um, if uh, you have any questions, make sure you uh, pop those into the questions section of the uh, GoToWebinar uh, little toolbar there. You can uh, go ahead and put your questions in. We've got a couple coming in, but uh, if, uh, if anybody wants to start getting them in, we're, we, may, we may do a question or two before uh, popping onto the demo. And, uh, we are pretty tight on time, Robert. So. Absolutely. So, okay, so um, I'll, uh, I'll run through very quickly. First, I'll point you at the image. This is quite interesting. You can see the, uh, the ductwork in this image is all red, so none of it was found. Um, now, what does that mean? It could mean that it wasn't installed. It might mean that there was something quite different than the model that we were supplied with. Um, but what is really worth um, looking at is if you look in the blue circle, you can see that there is an area of ductwork that actually conflicts with the red duct, uh, the ductwork that is in red. And that, um, so if that's a follow on package, there, uh, then what we've done is we've established that there's actually a problem there. Um, it's sort of something, Verity's not telling you that, but because this area of ductwork is red, so we know it's not installed, um, it's something to review. Um, and the, the reporting that we're doing with this sort of work, um, on, um, on one um, hand, we are reviewing um, small um, incremental um, differences in the model where something might be um, 500 millimeters out of position. But in a room like this, we would point to the, uh, to the room and say, um, nothing installed, um, but also there appear to be conflicts with this package, uh, with this package if it's not built, let, built yet. So that's the sort of thing we're highlighting. Um, I think, I'll probably almost wrap up now. What I'll say is, um, and there's a there's a blog that I wrote that um, that uh, I'll, uh, I'll I'll tweet about it. It's been tweeted fairly heavily in the last um, uh, few weeks, um, but uh, but it, it throws up this question: If you're as a surveyor, if you are starting to um, collect data that has been um, surveyed um, by other third parties. I really like this idea of in the future of the surveyor as a sort of um, hub for data coming in um, and in this workflow where we're perhaps getting data that's collected on site by a main contractor um, that uh, the surveyor as um, quality controller and um, suitability um, controller of data is uh, I think it's a new role that uh, we as surveyors are likely to have um, in the future. Um, so with that, I'll say thank you. I apologise, guys, if I've overrun a little bit, um, but uh, over to Kelly for the Verity 1.5. Yeah, thank, thank you very much for that. Um, I, I've got one quick question I'll ask while Kevin is spooling up to do the uh, demo here. Um, any, any consideration for me? Uh, sorry, uh, that, that's going to be another one. It's actually, oh, there it is. Um, have you tried any other mobile scanners, um, you know, outside of the GeoSlam? Are there any backpack scanners, anything else that you've tried uh, that you, you thought was uh, given good results as well? We've tried using, um, and this was on an earlier job, which we didn't um, verify with, um, but we tried using the Faro um, Freestyle. Um, and, and had problems with it. It was, uh, I'll, 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 I'll get uh, um, attacked by uh, some of my uh, buddies from Faro. Uh, um, it, it was an original model um, and we, we struggled a bit with um, just with uh, using the data on site and actually then the processing the data was quite slow at the end of things as well. Um, one of the things that I'm really keen to try um, is the, um, Surfaser do a, um, a, a mobile scanner which works on a trolley um, and uh, apparently gives some really nice results. Um, yeah. You can push it around at one meter a second, but uh, yeah, we'll be yeah. trialing that in the near future. 
I think it's called the Surf Slam, which is also That's I think the a, one. Yeah, the Surf Slam. You used the GeoSlam Hub to register the data, in fact. Um, yeah. yeah. All righty. Well, I, I see Kevin has kicked off an analysis in the background here, so I'll give a a quick little intro. Uh, I think the the last time we did a uh, a webinar on Verity, uh, it was uh, it was probably the 1.1 version. Uh, but there there have been a lot of things we've added over the last you know gosh six seven months, um, and uh, and Kevin's going to run you through some of them. It's certainly not all of them. Um, but we've got, uh, got kind of a number of exciting new features uh, that are going to be uh, coming out the gate uh, shortly. Um, one of them, uh, just to start out with, since uh, we're not going to demo, it, is uh, the 1.5 version, which again should be out in uh, mid-June. Uh, is uh, it, it runs on uh, on Navisworks uh, 2019, so uh, 2019 support is coming very shortly. Um, and with that. I will turn it over uh, to Kevin. All right, thank you, Kelly. Hey, let me ask you, are you able to see a, a refresh rate that's reasonable? Can I actually demo, or am I having lag issues? What, whatever was causing the lag before has gone away. So we, okay. we're seeing, the, it looked like you were getting pretty good performance. We were seeing the progress of our moving, Perfect. and we now see the uh, summary report has been up for a little bit, so. Okay. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to walk through just a, just a handful of some of the improvements that, that have gone into this, this package that we're going to be releasing in the, the not-too-distant future. Um, as Kelly mentioned, we now support Navisworks 2019, which is a, a, for people who are moving on to the newest version, that's obviously a biggie. Um, a, another is this uh, we, we pop up the summary report at the end of every analysis. So this is a, a relatively new feature. I, I believe some of, some of our uh, people who have downloaded the newer versions probably have seen that one before. Um, and I'm just going to, in the interest of time, I'm just going to blow through these fairly quickly. But you'll notice that if I support a scan, if I select a scan now inside of Verity, that scan shows up highlighted inside of Navisworks now. So that's a, a very nice handy feature just in terms of more communication back and forth between Verity and Navisworks. Uh, we've done quite a bit to improve that, that interoperability. Uh, we Actually, one nice thing here is uh, if you uh, do this, um, uh, you know, it lets you uh, really easily kind of pick and find those scans and understand which scans to load in, as, as opposed to having to load in every scan. Yeah, it, it really facilitates the analysis. Um, there is a new uh, scanner view option, which is if I if I click on one of these items here, and I look at it from the point of view of orthographic perspective, the new one is scanner view that shows the the object from the point of view of the the scanner that's got the most coverage on that object. And if I match view frames with Navisworks, which this is a this is a relatively recent feature, probably a number of you have already seen this one, but this this enables dynamic update between the the Navisworks view and the Verity view, which is really quite handy, but we're now in scanner view. Um, just another another visualization aid. I'm going to switch this back to orthographic, um, and then talk about adding items to to Verity, because we've uh, done a done a handful of improvements. One of the the things in a little bit earlier release is there are now multiple options for how to add things into Verity, and depending on how the models were created, what type of authoring tools were used to to build those objects, this gives you a little more control over how items are sectioned up. Um, the the tables at the bottom now have status bars. Um, which report the, the total number of items. So you can see down here um, at the very bottom 
uh, little bar inside of Verity, it says that there are 15 items. Um, so we now know how many how many items are, are loaded up. We know that there are three scans. Um, it's just kind of useful useful information to help you discern which which analysis you're working on. Um, we have also added, if I scroll over, we've got X and Y columns which help you locate, these are in project coordinates. So one of the things in the, the first release of the software was it was a little difficult to figure out where within your project coordinate system each element was. This is this helps out quite a quite a bit. Um, actually over here, the X location, Y location, and Z location. These are all in project coordinate space. Um, we've included some analysis enhancements as well. So if I scroll over on the table, you can see percent coverage that uh, I, because I'm, I'm not using the, the full version right now in this, this analysis, it's all labeled as zero, but once, the, once we release 1.5, those, those numbers will become meaningful, and that gives you an idea of how, what, what percentage of the surface area of each element was covered by points, and that gives you a little bit of, more of an idea of how accurate the analysis really is expected to be, and whether you know it gives you a it gives you a level of confidence in the results if there's more point coverage on the on the object. Um, the let's see what's next. Um, we've done some kind of back office cleanup so that you no longer need to to save all the scan cache folders. Um, for refitting and recalculating heat maps and things like that, and so that allows you to cut the project size pretty dramatically, which is a which is another really nice feature of the software, um, the feature of the, the the new version coming out. We've done a number of viewing enhancements as well, so you can now show or hide adjacent geometry. So if we look at this particular pipe. Um, if I turn on the neighbors, you can see a fragment of elbow, and this helps you you identify. The, unfortunately, I didn't select the other and analyze the other elbow that that attaches to it. But anything that's included in your analysis will also show up in this view frame, so that you can help orient yourself to the neighbors surrounding that element. This is uh, really useful if you're looking at, you know, penetrations in walls or if you're looking at racks of conduit or racks of pipe. It really helps you kind of understand the context of what, you know, what you've tried to fit uh, within Verity, what you've tried to find. So. Uh, yep, exactly. Uh, we, can, we can colorize a point cloud by scan location. So um, if I turn on scanner location, you can see... And if I look at down the axis of the object here, you can see the yellow points come from one scan location, the red points come from another, and that just is, is another clue to help you figure out what's what's happening on that object. Um, just just some useful information in your analysis. And then um, we've we've done a lot of work with the heat maps over the the, the last iteration of the software. So there's there's functionality to create a new heat map for as designed uncorrected, which is something that uh, let's let me go ahead and turn some of these heat maps on. So if I if I turn this on, turn off the points. This is the the heat map that you would get using something. Um, you know, just kind of a traditional analysis against the design model. Um, it it's not quite as meaningful as the the corrected heat maps that that Verity produces intrinsically, but it gives you a comparison against um, per, perhaps some of the other more traditional um, reverse engineering tools out there, so that you can see what's see what's happening and see kind of the 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 difference between the two analyses. Um, the, we've added the ability to have stepped color ranges rather than just a smooth transition like this. So there's, um, we can, we can change the, the number of gradients, uh, the, right now I've got three steps and all of, all of this can be dynamically sorted out on the fly. Um, 
there's the ability to you can you can see that there's both plus and minus ranges on the heat maps and so we can see whether uh, points are falling on the inside or on the outside surface of the object um, and we've, we've obviously got the scaling here and uh, new in 1.5 is the ability to it, the software will automatically recalculate all of these heat maps it used to be you had to refresh them um, but that's that's going away because um, that was that was a, a very po common request from people was was uh, they weren't sure if it was refreshing or not and so it's now just automatically refreshed all the time We've, in addition, made a, a bunch of enhancements to the QA tools. So the uh, now in the next version, the 1.5 version, if you sign in as an active reviewer, so if I sign my name in here, when I close out the project and open it back up, that will be saved and and I'll start back again I won't have to re-input everything the units are also saved so if I if I'm working in millimeters it's not going to go back to inches or anything like that you're, you're welcome Robert <laughs> yeah everybody in the UK was <laughs> um, that, that's it's that's still a not a user thing. setting but it's at least a project setting <laughs> <laughs> Um, when we're when we're editing the QA results, so if I'm, let me, you know, I'm going to make this a little bigger so we can see a little more what's going on. If I click and drag, I've got free range of motion, but we've now included the ability to um, snap things orthogonally. So now it it moves only along the um, along the right angle axes to that object uh, by holding down the control key. So we just gave more fine-tuned control over how to how to go through and, and QA things. Um, the rotational component of this, it instead of rotating about the center, we now rotate about the opposite corner. So this is this is a lot a lot easier to adjust things rotationally now. Um, and then to make it obvious that the as-built can be moved in this in this view frame, you'll see, you'll notice that it highlights as I as I hold the mouse over it. And um, so it, it's we've got a whole bunch of a whole bunch more user cues to make sure that you understand what's what's happening going on here. Um, measurement tools. We've got uh, a number of tools that have been out in the last release and, and have been improved slightly in this, this up and coming one, but we've got tools to measure the, the distance from the surface of the object to the, the point cloud and so you can get very accurate uh, measurements, point measurements at any location on the object you want. Um, and there's there's a whole bunch of whole bunch of functionality in, embedded in these tools, but it takes an average average distance at a point. Um, and then finally, we've got the the technical previews. Um, so the included in that are we've got the mobile data technical preview that that Robert was talking about, and so it's compatible now with GeoSlam data. Um, and uh, Kelly, are are there a couple others? Are there any others that will be compatible with shortly? Um, we're we're hoping to, and it's it's actually a relatively simple set of things we need from uh, providers. So if any 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 of our current customers or potential uh, you know, interested parties. Um, if you work with a vendor uh, that you know has produces mobile scanners or even photogrammetry um, uh, vendors, um, you know we can sit down and talk with them, and you know in a you know couple of days worth of work on their end, they can probably write out the files that we need. So I'm happy to expand that beyond uh, you know uh, to, to to more vendors. Um, and it's, then, of course, it's we've also you say that, Chris. Oh, sorry. Um, it's interesting you say that, Chris. In that, uh, I know on 
uh, the building that I've just shown. There was some talk about collecting data with a Matterport um, mm. and seeing whether whether we could uh, do anything with the data from the Matterport. Um, it certainly looks very nice. Um, I'm not uh, well. The jury's out until uh, until we until we try it. But uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I think we we've, we've had a number of customers ask about uh, Matterport as well. So you know. Uh, all I can say there is if, if you're a Matterport customer, reach out to Matterport and tell them to give us a call. Uh, we're, we're, uh, we're more than happy to uh, kind of sit down and, and get them to shoot out what we need. Um, and then we do have two other technical previews, of course. We've got an integration with them 360 Field uh, and also a new integration coming out with 1.5 uh, for the first time. Uh, and that's an integration with BIM Track, which is a... Uh, uh, also a kind of issue tracking tool, but it's focused on the coordination space. And it's got a great 3D model viewer online that's IFC based, and you can actually publish our views up to it and then see them in the model context online in a web viewer. So uh, that's, uh, that's that's pretty slick. So uh, by all means, uh, when it comes out the door, take a look at that and uh, you know sign up for a free account on BIMTRAC, and you can uh, you know experiment with their software. It's uh, it's it's pretty cool. So. Um, yeah, and we've got a couple of questions uh, that we we need to get to here um, uh, that have been queued up. So, uh, Kevin, if, unless there was anything else, I think uh, I think no, let's, let's, the let's, let's move on to questions. All righty. So, for, for Robert, um, was GeoSlam's accuracy good enough for ductwork comparison? Would BLK three hundred and sixty results be better? Sorry, just unmute myself. Um, I, I, I think um, BLK results would be better because uh, BLK is a uh, is a stationary scanner. Um, uh, it, it depends what you're trying to do, um, and the reason we were using GeoSlam was because we uh, we could cover a lot of area. Um, the job that I went to see today, we'll be using um, high definition scanning, um, uh, probably uh, using Faros. Um, and I mean, it all, it's sort of horses for courses, I suppose. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to remember the, uh, accuracy figures that I've seen quoted for BLK. Um, but it's, it's a combination of what you're trying to achieve, how close you want the tolerance to be. Um, you know, do you really need to do, um, say, um, 15 millimeter verification on ductwork? Um, I've not met any body or any main contractor who's that precious about the position of it um, and the what you've got to build into that is if you're using a tripod based scanner then obviously the time to collect the stand, scan data is going to be much greater um, you know you um, we did three floors of the building that I showed in um, in about four hours um, with the BLK or, or any of the other terrestrial scanners we'd have probably collected um, one or um, at most one and a half floors in uh, in in a whole session um, so yeah I, that's why I say it's horses for courses if you uh, if you're trying to identify smaller things um, then um, then you you really need to use a, um, a, a traditional scanner um, but actually again um, the the quality of the cloud, you may find that actually you're better off using a higher spec scanner than than a BLK. Um, yeah. And then uh, all, there was also a follow-on question about the uh, smallest pipe sizes verified. And again, to your point, the uh, it's really a question of the the data. So you know, one of the rules of thumb yep. that I tell people during training is that you know, with at least with Verity. If the noise is kind of half the the size of the object, Verity will do a relatively good job fitting it. It's better if it's a you know quarter. So if you've got a you know two inch uh, or 50 millimeter pipe uh, that you're trying to te test, you really want your scan data to be you know at least plus or minus 25 mils on the noise. Ideally, more like 12 mils on the noise. So. Um, you know that that to your point that would push you pretty quickly to a terrestrial scanner um yeah. you know if you're looking at two inch pipes if you're looking at you know 10 inch pipes then uh, 
you know, that gets a lot easier with something like the GeoSlam. Yeah, I think the other thing to bear in mind is the quality of the scan um, not only affects the quality of the verification that you can perform, but it affects the quality of the registration that you can do with terrestrial scans. And so, you know, the um, there are a whole series of, um, of very low cost scanners. All of them, the data is um, well. One, they're they're pretty short range in re in reality, even though. You know, you might be sort of saying 30 meters. Um, we probably wouldn't trust the data beyond about five meters. Um, but actually, the quality of the registration from uh, from the cheaper models, because you've got more noise and more junk in the scans, um, is, uh, is is going to affect the quality of your registration, um, which in turn will affect the reliability of the verification you can perform with it. Yeah. Indeed. And then one, one last question, uh, you know, how do we how do we export the verified and adjusted model back to Revit? And so I'll uh, I'll take that one. The short answer is uh, we've got a number of different exports. Uh, the, the one that's most commonly used is our smart point export. So um, if you uh, and Kevin, you may want to show it real quick in the background while I talk about it. Um, but uh, for selected elements. Uh, you can go export out smart points, which is basically the points you see on the screen when you click the button. So in this case, we would get a very small PTS file, probably, you know, 200, 250 kilobytes uh, of just the heat mapped points for this individual pipe uh, that would go out to a PTS file. So um, the most common workflow is you grab all the out of tolerance elements that you need to, you know, update the as built for export them out to smart points uh, and then you can ship that off to whoever's going to update the model and they don't have to deal with the entire point cloud just a couple little points and you can send some of the html reports uh, and other information along with it also in 2018 and 2019 autodesk versions you can bring a navisworks file into revit as a link so you can actually as built the navisworks model with our uh, update host uh, functionality and then bring the updated Navis model into Revit so you can see the as-built geometry snap to it, uh, you know, with the uh, design geometry in Revit. So a couple different ways to do that. There's, again, not an easy button to quote Robert. Um, there's a couple other technical questions we'll follow up with after the uh, webinar. Um, but uh, we are three minutes past time. Uh, so want to be respectful of everybody. Thank you so much for uh, dialing in and listening and sticking with us. I uh, hope you got a lot of good, useful information about what's new and some really interesting workflows uh, that Robert uh, and his team are starting to do. Um, yeah. Um, thanks again, and uh, look forward to talking to you next time. Uh, thank you, guys. Um, cheers, cheers, guys.